So, hypothetically, you're a gamer and you aren't very impressed at the next generation Wi-Fi router or refrigerator. Totally understandable. You then probably want to build a gaming PC but have run into a problem, or should I say, many problems. All these different parts with different gigabytes, clock speeds, frequencies, and more, and once you find the right Terra shards needed per gigafart, are all the parts even compatible? And when they are, I mean, <laughs> we all know you can't build anything. I mean, you couldn't even hold the flashlight for your dad, right? What makes you think you could build a gaming computer? But once you finally think you have what it takes to build a gaming computer and, oh my god, there's water in these computers too? Like, what, what even is that? Yeah, don't worry, I was very skeptical when thinking to build my first PC, especially a water-cooled one, but hopefully this tutorial will help my 23,000 beautiful subscribers, as well as anyone who wishes to build a gaming PC, do it. So, here's the PC that I've just built, it is a custom water-cooled and all, however, I have been building this PC for the past two months, and if you know anything about time, you know two months is a very long amount of time, and... You shouldn't take two months to build your PC, so hopefully I will show you guys all the things I messed up on and all the tips and tricks that could have helped me save time so that you guys can build your PCs efficiently and not in two months. If you're planning on not building a water-cooled PC, this tutorial will still help, however, I went the extra mile and for whatever reason put water where electronics are because I don't know. But yeah, hopefully you guys will enjoy this video and let's begin. I will leave timestamps here in case you want to skip. But without further ado, let's start with the basics of building a PC. Each gaming PC will have all of these components, including the CPU, a motherboard, RAM, a graphics card, a power supply, a case, and an SSD or a hard drive, depending on what you want. Now, the one part I didn't mention in all of this was cooling the components. You see, all these parts working together tend to get very hot when under heavy loads, like playing Crisis 3, or doing a heavy task, like rendering at full speeds. In order to cool your components down, this is where it's up to you to do one of the three options. Go completely air-cooled, AIO-cooled, or completely custom water-cooled. I have no idea how to do this, however, if you are looking on how to do this, please go somewhere else. Starting off with the easiest is air-cooled. All you'll need to do is get case fans as well as a CPU fan unit. The GPU will already come assembled with fans on it so you don't have to worry about that. If planning to do an AIO cooled system, you will still need case fans but instead of a CPU fan, these AIOs are CPU water blocks that are attached to a radiator and pre-assembled with coolant already stored inside of them. They're completely shut so you won't leak and you won't have to change the water inside of them as well. And you need to have fans screwed onto them so you can cool down the radiator when the hot coolant goes inside of it. Most AIOs are primarily for CPUs, there are some for GPUs but I'm not talking about those. And lastly we have fully custom water cooling. Custom water cooling is the most versatile of all and it will allow you to pick what gets cooled and what doesn't. You can do a full custom cooled loop like myself or you can only cool your CPU or only your GPU, it's honestly up to you. If planning on doing custom loop you're going to need specific gear. Some of the gear that you will have to have is a pump and a reservoir, a CPU or a GPU water block, tubing, fittings, and radiators. There's a couple extras that you don't need but will definitely help in the long run and I'll get to those later. Starting off with tubing, when doing custom water cooled loops you have the choice of either hard tubing or soft tubing. Hard tubing are pipes that are sold stiff and need to be placed under high amounts of heat from a heat gun to loosen up and bend to your liking, while soft tubing is a flexible plastic material that doesn't require any heating whatsoever. When custom water cooling, you need to pick which tube you're going to go for in advance. I highly recommend that lazier people use soft tubing because it's way easier. I'm not going to say that I regret doing hard tubing, but soft tubing would have been so much easier. Moving on to fittings, there's a bunch of different sized fittings, but all you gotta know is that the first number is the inner diameter and the last number is the outer diameter. The inner diameter and the outer diameter of both your tubing as well as your fitting need to match up so that your fitting and your tubing will be snug in place so that no water leaks in your system. Make sure you also grab a good amount of angled and adjustable fittings as they can be lifesavers for making your hard loop much easier. Moving on to pump and res combos, there's many different kinds of them some being sold separately as well, but just know that if you plan on getting a pump, there are manual speed pumps and there are PWM pumps, which can be set based on temperature or just to your liking in the BIOS. Next up are water blocks. These water blocks will sit on top of your CPU and GPU and allow incoming water to transfer the heat to the radiators and cool down the water in your loop. For CPU, make sure your CPU water block is for the CPU chip that you have. It should also be the same CPU chip that your motherboard supports. 
And for your GPU, make sure it's the same card number as well as the same card brand. By this I mean there are many cards that are the same number, for example the 2080 Ti. However, different companies like Asus, Zotac, MSI, etc. will essentially put their own twist on these cards, which is usually only just the form of heat sinks or predetermined overclocking. But regardless, when getting a GPU water block, if you wish to cool your system, it has to be the exact same GPU you plan on getting. So for example, in my system, the 2080 Ti water block I got was specifically for the Asus 2080 Ti. Moving on to radiators, a good rule of thumb for custom water cooling is that every main component you plan on cooling should include a radiator. So if you plan on cooling both the CPU and the GPU, you should have a minimum of two radiators for the best results. Feel free to add more if your case allows it, but honestly two should be quite enough. And while bigger can be better, make sure that your case can support the radiator you intend on buying. They can get really, really big. I personally have two 360mm radiators and they fit perfectly inside my full tower which is a lot larger than the average mid tower case. To cool the radiators down you need to place fans on top of them so you can push the air through them and cool down the fins. Static pressure fans are optimal for cooling down radiators. This has been tested on Jay's Two Cents video where you can see that the temperatures are much lower with static pressure rather than just airflow. However, I didn't see this video until after I was done making my PC, so I put airflow fans on my radiator. But don't worry, my temps aren't crazy high, they are higher than they would be if I had static pressure fans. But rule of thumb, try to get static pressure fans, but if you already got your fans and you can't return them, don't worry about it. Moving on to some accessories you could find really helpful, some neat parts such as built in temperature status screens can help track your temps without, you know, opening software or whatnot. You could also get a flow meter thing that kind of looks like a gigantic fan to make sure that your pump is pushing out water at good speeds. And also a well placed drain valve can be extremely helpful when draining and maintaining your system, which is something you should do every so often based on the type of coolant you use and how much you use your system. And last up we got distro plates, which can sometimes simplify your loop as well as look super cool, but these are primarily just for looks, so if you're trying to keep a tight budget, I wouldn't recommend getting one. Moving on to coolant, you will either need a pre-packaged anti-corrosive mix, usually dyed or clear, or just some distilled water, not tap water. To make sure your parts are safe, try to use light dye coolants rather than heavy, but if you do use thicker coolants, for example the super cool Primo Chill View, make sure to drain and clean your system regularly so that they don't bunch up on your CPU and GPU blocks, making your temps higher and also making a pain in the ass to clean. Overall it's a good bet to change your system's liquid around 2-3 to three times a year, but honestly just do whatever you gotta do, I mean there's some people who leave their coolant in for like 3 years straight and it still works, but if you want your parts to last long and to look nicer and to be more efficient, clean out your freaking water. So that's about all that goes into water cooling. Now let's go into some tips before starting your PC build, whether it be water cooled, air cooled, AIO cooled, whatever. The two biggest tips I have before starting even building or buying anything is to make a blueprint for your build and to prepare for the worst. By blueprint, I mean make sure you have a parts list of each part that you will need, make sure they are compatible with one another beforehand by using PC Part Picker, and make a rough draft of what you envision your PC looking like. For example, if you planned on building a mini ITX PC, then you would need to make sure that all the parts would be able to fit in your case, especially if you're doing a custom water cooling loop as the radiator can take up a bunch of space. Also, if you plan on doing custom water cooling, make sure to draft a couple ideas on how you want to go about looping all the parts together. The other tip that I mentioned was preparing for the worst. Please take that to heart because you have no idea how annoying it is to wait an additional two weeks, even a month maybe, just for a part to ship that you already have but you just ran out of. For example, in my water cooling loop, I didn't get enough 90 degree angled fittings, so I had to order them again, and it took almost like two and a half weeks to ship. So just because I didn't decide to play it safe and get an extra fitting for like, I don't know, three dollars, I had to wait an additional like, I don't know, like 20 days almost. So yeah, play it safe, get extras, if, I mean you never know, maybe one of them will break in the future and you need, I, I don't know how a fitting would break, but uh, anyways, just, just get extra, that's all I'm trying to say. Also, before you start building, make sure that you realize how expensive a gaming PC can be and how expensive you want it to be. If you really want a really nice PC, then you better, I don't know, sell your kidney or something. But with that sad note, just know that prices are really getting cheaper for quality parts. Just good luck trying to get one. Now, before you even start getting your case involved with the build, let alone water cooling, you're going to want to do what's called a test bench to make sure that all your parts are working and compatible with one another. 
So to do this, lay the motherboard down, place the CPU and RAM inside, making sure that your RAM is in the right positioning. If you have four sticks of RAM, this doesn't apply. But make sure that you put your GPU on as well as your CPU fan. If you're like me and we're doing strictly custom water cooling, I went out of my way to buy just like a $20 CPU fan just for the sake of this test bench. Feel free to either keep it in case or return after you're done, but it's safer to not run your CPU without a CPU cooler, especially for a long period of time. If you have an AIO, you can just run the AIO as is, but make sure to plug the AIO into the AIO pump port or the CPU fan port, wherever it tells you to in the manual. Have the power supply off to the side and connect the GPU, CPU, and 24 pin connection. If you have an M.2 SSD like me, those just need to be screwed into the motherboard. However, if you have an external SSD or hard drive, you're going to have to plug that into SATA cables. After all is plugged in, test your system and make sure all parts work together. In order to test it because you don't actually have a power button because it's not connected to your case, you have to short circuit it with like a piece of metal. You can just use a screwdriver. Here's the video on how to do that. I don't want to take any fault if you end up messing up your system. But yeah, after all is plugged in, test your system, make sure all the parts work. And here's my reaction when mine booted up into the BIOS for the first time. So far, the picture is not coming on to the screen <gasps> yes <laughs> yes <laughs> no way here's where water cooling takes a different turn than air cooling if you plan on air cooling you're basically halfway done already when you do the benchmark however with water cooling you still have a lot more things to do before even mounting anything you should first make sure you have that blueprint like i told you before on how exactly you wish to loop the entire loop meaning how to connect all the parts including the cpu gpu radiator and pump as well as a distro plate if you have one another thing to do before mounting anything inside of your case is to make sure that you clean out your radiators get distilled water and put it inside the radiator shake it up and just dump the water maybe two or three times there's a bunch of little black pieces like of metal that usually come in radiators and you don't want that anywhere inside your loop so get as many as you can out when designing your loop many people will tell you oh man you got to make it so that there's a radiator in between each part for optimal cooling yeah these individuals are missing some brain cells all right the temperature of the water will be in equilibrium, so it's not that a certain part will be cooled based off of where the radiator is in the loop order, rather the entirety of the loop will be cooled by these radiators. So don't worry about loop order. If you don't believe me, check out a Jay's Two Cents video on it. He does like everything water cooled related, and honestly you should probably be on his page rather than mine. So once you've drawn out what you believe your loop will be, it's time to take your benchmark and modify it a little bit. Take off the stock cooler and place your water block on instead. After that, it's up to you to decide where you plan on having your fans and radiators on your case. Always have more intake than outtake in regards to fans, and make sure that all your radiators are equipped with preferably static pressure fans. After placing your radiators on the case, put your power supply at the bottom, and when doing custom water cooling, placing the fan downwards is your best bet, both cooling as well as lowering the chances of damage in your case for loop leaks. While you can use the stock power supply cables, many like the look of a lot cleaner individual lined cables such as cable mods, so if that's what you're interested in, make sure you go buy those too. And also make sure you attach the tiny case pins before plating on your GPU. If you have a GPU water block, you're going to want to put that on your GPU. When you get your water block, there should either be instructions or videos on YouTube on how to unscrew and disassemble your GPU and put the new thermal pads as well as screws in to attach your GPU block to the entire thing. Extra tip, if you plan on mounting your GPU vertically, which I highly suggest because it shows off your sexy water block, you need to make sure that if your case doesn't support vertical mounting, that when you get an adapter that will go where the horizontal slots are for the GPU, that you have a way of cutting the metal brackets off so that your ports are available vertically. All that's left is mounting your pump and res combo somewhere in your loop and making sure that all the cables are routed in the back of the case. This includes the RGB 3-pin and 4-pin cables, your fan cables, etc. Anything that will connect to a hub you'll probably want to have in the back as well. And anything that had to be plugged into the motherboard, you should have plugged in before you put the GPU. Now comes the fun part. Get your fittings out and place them onto the ports for your radiator, your pump in and out, your CPU in and out, your GPU in and out, and if applicable, your distro plate. Since you should already know the loop order because I told you to blueprint before, now all you have to do is either attach your tubing if you're using soft tubing, or you can bend the acrylic tubing like I did. For hard tubing, you will need a heat gun and you will also need an insert. This insert needs to be the same inner diameter as your tube size and it will ensure that the heat doesn't make your tubing collapse. 
You'll also need tube cutters and this drill fitting can help smoothen the final cut as well as shave a couple inches rather than just cutting it too short with the clipper. All of these as well as all my parts for the entirety of my build will be down below in the link in the description. They will all be Amazon affiliate links, so if you buy them, I will get a kickback at no cost to you, and if they're not on Amazon, then I'll link wherever I got them. So please use them. Rotate your tube slowly over medium to low heat, not too high or else your tubing can get bubbly, and then curve them either by eye, which is more for an advanced builder, or use angle fittings such as these, which I used, which you just have to kind of shove in once you're done heating them up till they're flimsy enough, and then they will curve to either 90 degrees, 45 degrees, or 180 degrees. Attach all the tubing and make sure no ports are open and that the ones that have covers are securely in place. Now, the moment we have been waiting for filling and testing the loop. Since we want to test the loop before turning all the parts on, you will need a motherboard starter like this or you could just use a paper clip. This will plug into the 24 pin and it will basically allow for the power supply to turn on without actually powering on the motherboard including the graphics card or the CPU. This is really good so that there's no electricity flowing through the GPU, CPU, or motherboard which will allow it that if the pump does leak it won't damage your parts as long as you let it dry correctly. So now, just make sure that your CPU cord and your GPU cords are unplugged so there's no power going into them, and fill your pump with distilled water. Make sure to place paper towels around the parts so just in case it does leak, you won't cause too much of a mess. This includes around all the fittings as well as over your power supply just in case it does leak, you don't want that to get wet. Now, all you have to do is plug in the power supply cord into an outlet, flip the switch to on, and you should see the pump automatically push water through your loop. Oh shit. Oh shit! Flip the switch off after the tube is no longer filled with water as we don't want the pump running dry and then rinse and repeat until your entire loop is filled with water. To ensure there's no leaking, you can run this from anywhere from 2 to 12 hours depending on how careful you want to be in ensuring that there's no leaking. But you could also use an air pump kit which EKWB sells. Basically, it'll just kind of mimic the pressure that water would hold and if you don't lose pressure that means that there's no leaking. I didn't get this personally because I didn't want to spend the money as well as didn't want to wait for the shipping fee which is kind of a stupid reason not to do it but if you want to do it without even having the risk of leaking in your system I highly suggest using this. So now that your leak is fully tested time to cable manage and plug everything in. A majority of your connections should already be plugged in in terms of RGB and fans and everything else. However, you still need to plug in the CPU, the 24 pin, and the GPU to the power supply. And now, as long as you've plugged in your case pins correctly, which are the really small ones that you should have plugged in before your GPU, you should be able to press the power button on and your entire PC should boot up while the pump is running. A couple of key tips. When water cooling both for AO and custom, radiators, like I said, will be best with static pressure fans. That's something that I really wanted to enforce because I really regretted not getting static pressure fans. And if you are just in the beginning of making your parts list, make sure to get the static pressure fans for your radiators. Also, make sure that if you plan on doing a lot of extra accessories such as RGB or those previously mentioned um, temperature gauges for the fittings, you gotta know where those will plug in and if your motherboard will support those ports. For example, my EKWB pump had a 3-pin RGB strip inside of it, but my motherboard doesn't even have a 3-pin RGB header. Now normally this would just have been my bad at not calculating for the RGB port and I wouldn't have been able to turn it on whatsoever. However, thanks to this guy's video, I found out that you can actually buy a converter that will allow it to connect to the Corsair Commander Pro and it'll allow a 3-pin to be identifiable as a Corsair RGB strip. Super cool. But yeah, that's about everything that I got out of my experience from building. Just have a lot of patience, trust in yourself, and take a lot of breaks because Honestly, working for too long can make you mess up, even like the best builders mess up all the time. So I was lucky that I didn't have too many mess ups, besides the fact that it literally took me two months to build. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. If there's any questions you have down below, please let me know. I'll try my best to answer them because I remember reaching out to YouTubers about specific water cooling things and they never answered me. So hopefully I will actually answer your guys' questions if I read them. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. Like I said, make sure to comment down below and also make sure to subscribe if you enjoyed it and liked the video. So without further ado, let's dash to the next video.